My name is Greg Hitchings. I live down pretty much in the Missouri B B boot heel. I'll be one of the most Southern members of Great Plains Master Beekeeping. Um, we're gonna be talking about some specific topics that Sheldon mentioned and uh, you know things like nukes, uh, packages, um, getting ready to start with bees. We're at that time of year. And this is me. Um, and I wanna point out, as Judy mentioned, tell you a little bit about me. In 1966, I was mentored by an elderly beekeeper that needed somebody to help him with about 30 hives. And uh, he really relied on the income from that. And I was 12 years old at the time. And he spent two years with me and I spent with him working on bees. And uh, he told me he'd make me a beekeeper and I've been one ever since. It's been a total of 56 years since then. I've kept bees continually since then. Um, that being said, uh, gotta have a caveat here. Do not assume I know what I'm talking about um, because my experience is restricted to the Southern part of Missouri. And I may not have the knowledge base to really help you with any, any specific uh, situations. But I've kept bees a long time. I'm a hobbyist. Um, I'm down in almost in the Missouri boot heel, as you can see on the screen. And of course, my cursor isn't working on the screen. But you see the red star down there. Um, and what we're going to be talking about to, tonight is, as I mentioned, getting started in bees, um, nukes and packages and things like that. And one thing that really irks me a little bit about, about Zoom meeting, I'm sorry, YouTube meetings, is you know, you'll have a guy walking out to his apiary and you're, you're seeing the visual and he's talking about, hey, great day to work bees at 62 degrees. This is my hive. A uh, couple of hives I've got here, and then I've got a couple couple hundred yards over there. And then he starts talking about his management decisions, and it doesn't help. We don't have a clue as to where he is. Well, this gives you a clue as to where I am. And for those folks in North Missouri, my beekeeping compadres up in the upper part of the state, we may be two or three weeks at times ahead of them whenever it comes to spring and whenever it comes to the tasks that we may need to be working on. And from the southeast of Nebraska, say about the Lincoln area to my place is about 500 miles. That gives you a little bit of, of a dimension there. So there's differences in not just um, our temperatures and that kind of thing, but there's differences obviously in forage you know, all beekeeping is local. You're going to hear that all the time. Beekeeping is local. You look at my location there in Mississippi River is just east of me, about 80 miles. And it's a different ball game over there. Um, a really great beekeeper that we lost uh, a year ago or a little more, uh, Grant Gillard, um, good friend. And he, he ran a commercial business over there. And he didn't have any forage like I have. I have very, I have very meager forage actually. I'm in cattle country mostly. Everything 160 degrees south of me is uh, 180 degrees south of me is going to be forest, and so I have open pasture and, and farmland around me. A few beans, soybeans. Um, he he, uh, Grant would beekeep around Cape Girardeau County and Scott County. And you ask him, how much do you produce, Grant? And he his standard answer is, well, in Scott County, I average about 50 pounds a hive. And I'm sorry, in Cape County, I, I average about 50 pounds a hive. I go south, uh, you know, 30 miles, and I'll be getting 100 pounds. And that's a significant difference than what I would get. I don't get that kind of harvest like, like Grant did. By the same token, 30 no, not that far. 20 miles just north of me, there's a real good uh, locust flow. And I, I don't get that. But the farther we go up north, you know, we have a different perspective up there than what, 
we do down here. Just out of uh, curiosity, I checked our latitude here. And, you know, we like the Italian bee. That's the one that's most adapted to what we use. And if you just draw a line, well, it's it's got a name. It's the 37th parallel. If you just drive drop that around the globe, draw it around, you'll be crossing Sicily in Italy. And so we live in a temperate uh, environment with the temperate seasons, definite fall, spring, winter, summer, and uh, that those are the situations on that side of the world in Sicily and in Italy where the bees that we find most useful, where they evolved. And so from the standpoint of us, we're fortunate and we're, we're probably a little better adapted for the true Italian than, than what you guys are, are farther north. But anyway, um, that's a little bit about me and where I live. And I'm gonna be a little different than, than other folks that maybe sharing information with you on these B hours, because my goals in life are different than what theirs may be. I manage my bees different. I manage them for what I like to do and for my own goals. My goals are my goals, and I'm not a commercial beekeeper. I never have been. Um, I've been a hobbyist all my life. I just like to work with, with bees. That's just, that's just my thing. I don't push honey production on my bees. For me, um, I enjoy teaching people. I enjoy working with people in the hives, hands-on stuff. Um, you know, I feel that as a whole, there's a lot of knowledge out there, a lot of stuff to be gained by study, by looking at appropriate YouTube videos, by studying educational stuff on the internet, um, in books, good books. There are lots of them out there. Um, but really hands-on component is important. You know, visually with YouTube videos, with um, sitting in a classroom, we get information fed to us in two ways, you know, visual and audio. Uh, uh, audio. And when you get in a beehive, you're using all potentially all five of your senses. And I, I really like to work with those types of beekeepers, you know, uh, zero to three, three years of experience before they're sustainable. And uh, that's what I like to do. So I keep a number of my colonies. I'll have 12 to 15. I'll, I'll have 15 this year, just teaching colonies. And they're gonna be in different setups, you know, um, but most of them are gonna be single deeps without things above them. Cause, and I keep them, I keep them not full from the standpoint of large populations of bees, just simply for the comfort level of getting in there and not having to remove uh, the second deep or even uh, supers on some of them. So I'll rob the brood to keep them uh, to keep them low. But so my goals in life are a little different. I like having honey for the family and for gifts and for selling. I only sell in one real estate, uh, real retail establishment. Um, and so I've processed enough, <laughs> enough honey in my life that it's, it's not, a draw for me anymore, but I still enjoy the bees. I just thoroughly enjoy the bees. I generally feed as little as possible. Um, and I know there, there are people that really promote a great deal of uh, feeding. And as soon as you can get them fed in the spring, I'm not like that. I like to look at what I need to do with those hives and react accordingly. I'm a firm believer in uh, picking up the weight of the colony tilt method of figuring out how they compare to other hives. If they're weak in, you know, I'll feed, gosh, yes, to keep them alive, I will feed. If I'm needing to make splits, golly gee, I'll start off feeding, feeding early. But I don't want, I don't want to be uh, early spring feeding on my production colony so that they outbrood the spring and uh, issue swarms before, if they're a swarm risk before honey production. So these are some of the things I take into consideration. I don't like synthetics for mite control. Um, I'm able to keep uh, mite levels low with uh, VSH queens and their progeny. And uh, that's what I like to do. I want my bees to winter healthy and I want them in the fall when possible. And I've struck out the last two falls. I want them to go into the winter with heavy, um, heavy honey, heavy on honey. And um, 
it just hasn't cooperated the last year. I've had just had a complete bust on on fall uh, hunting. So uh, the goldenrod and the asters just haven't done anything for me here. Um, I like to overwinter in deeps, and I don't know if that's even in a single deep. I don't know if that's even possible for you folks up in Iowa, but it's it's great for me when I can when I can overwinter in single deeps, and I'll make a split in August. And uh, I'm, I'm involved a little bit in selling bees, not nukes or, or packages, but just the bees and kind of a artificial swarm. And, um, you know, I do that as part of my management strategy. Um, I, and I don't know if you folks in Iowa and Nebraska, if you can overwinter in singles, but it's easy to do here. Um, I'll either be in single deeps going into the winter, healthy bees. Um, or I'll have a single deep um, with a, what we used to call in the old days, a food chamber, a shallow. I don't use any shallows, but that was common in the past. And, and then mediums have a, have a single medium over there that's full of honey and then put them on a, on a single deep and take those into the winter. Uh, I've overwintered. I started with 30 colonies in uh, October. I, I started with more. But then I combined a few that I was a little concerned about. And then I've I've lost two so far, uh, two dead outs. And so I'm pretty pleased with that. Um, I control swarm tendency through through mentoring, and that's that's another story, and I won't get into that right now. But anyway, that being said, um, are there any questions before we get into the into the nukes and, and package aspects of what we're about to talk about. Time's up. <laughs> you got to jump in. I've got ground to cover, so I'm just going to go ahead. And yeah, I think we're in. good to go. I think we're good to go. Let's, let's hear it. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Okay. Share screen. Okay. Let's talk about nukes. Okay. Um, let me move some things around on my screen. Okay. Basically, we know what a nucleus colony is. Normally, they're five frames. Uh, for beginners, they often talk about, uh, they think in terms of buying. That's, that's the way I'm going to get my first bees, is either nukes or packages. Um, but, you know, as a bee, beekeeper expands his experience, nukes turn into a whole new realm. And I hope the beginners that are listening here tonight understand that uh, for many of us, Nukes are an extremely important part of our uh, operation. Uh, I love nukes. I haven't, I've never bought a nuke, um, but I love to have them on the place and keep, keep a nuke for every uh, four or five colonies that I have because they're very, very handy for storing queens. They're great brood banks uh, so that you can, uh, you, can, you can add them when necessary or simply some of the brood from your nukes. Of course, what's, pic what's pictured here up in the upper left-hand corner is going to be uh, a nuke box that is for sale. That's the type, that's the type of nuke box that a, that a new beekeeper may purchase in some cases, or if he's, he's getting the hard shell, at the real honest-to-goodness wooden, wooden nuke, he very well, very likely is going to be getting woodenware that uh, if, if he buys it, and it's part of his, he doesn't have to return it, then that can be utilized a lot in, uh, in the future for him. Um, there are a lot of pros to nukes. I'm sorry, to, yeah, to nukes. Um, it's actually a functioning colony. It has, you know, when, when we're talking a nuke, it's gonna have a laying queen, it's gonna have uh, all stages of brood, meaning eggs, larva, um, and pupa. And it's going to have um, honey resources, pollen resources to support brood rearing. Um, normally, they're sold in, in four or five frame nukes. 
and they'll grow pretty fast. You know, that's a functioning colony. They are ready to get going. The comb is provided in those five frames. So a beginner simply puts on each side of it. They'll, they'll end up with the five comb frames in the center, and then they may put foundation on the sides to make it a eight or a 10 frame uh, box, whichever size you're, you're using. I don't, I don't encourage the belief that a nuke is going to be producing honey the first year. Maybe that's the mere fact that I, I live in an area where we just don't have really good forage. And so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't tell a beginner starting out here in Iron County, Missouri to expect a honey harvest the first time. But another thing to consider with the bees is that they're all genetically uh, sisters. They, they are all very closely related. Now, this may be dependent upon when the producer put a queen in that colony, but in theory, they're all very closely related. Uh, and truthfully, a nucleus genera generally has a little better uh, chance of success than say a package does. But there are some disadvantages. Nukes can be a little bit more expensive. Um, they can sure vary in their quality compared to producer here and producer there. Um, I don't know what the status is in some of the states that you may be from, but in Missouri, we have no state inspection uh, from the stand standpoint of bees can be sold in the state of Missouri willy nilly without any inspection or approval. Um, that's not the case for transporting out, but it is truth for just selling bees. Um, so there's there's some variance among some of the producers. Missouri has started, oh gosh, when bees got so hard to find, you know, back in the colony collapse disorder days, and finally when we started to figure out, hey, you know, we can handle this, we can get this, and beekeepers started to have a little bit more control of their mite populations, we had a lot of people going to business of producing nukes. And that's a good thing. And, and sometimes it's not a good thing. And it kind of depends upon the morals of the, of the producer. There are some really good ones. There are some really good ones that will work with beginners in Missouri. And there are some that, you know, they're, they're more intent on, on just getting that sale. Um, there are, oops, let me back up. I don't want to show that yet. There are. Uh, Oh wait, Greg. Whoop. Yes. Uh, so we we have experienced unfortunately receiving um what could be most best described as a spicy lot of packet of nukes. <laughs> and and it was just a, a um we received a, a bunch of nukes that were temperamental and a bit more aggressive than we would normally like. And so we were, I was just wondering what your recommendations are for when you receive nukes that you really like, and what do you do with those? And then what do you do when you get a, a, a bunch of nukes that maybe aren't as um, gentle and productive as you would like? Well, Judy, I don't deal in nukes at all, except my only experience with nukes is a, a, attending or, or walking with a new beekeeper who's going to one of our nuke producers who wants me to inspect their colony because they're not, they don't feel good about it. And I've had a lot of experience with the common diseases in Missouri. And, and so I've gone to nuke producers with a young beekeeper and we'll insist, hey, you know, we'll complete this sale um, if it's an appropriate nuke. And we've turned nukes down and walked away from producers that uh, didn't, didn't show an inclination to make things right. Um, we'll, get, we'll get more into that here in a little bit. But I, you know, I would, I highly recommend to anybody buying a nuke that they get pre-approval uh, rights, that a right of refusal re re uh, rights would be a better way of putting that. When they go pick up their nuke, the, the producer says, hey, it's ready, come on, you drive to my farm and I'll load it up for you. Well, I wanna look at that nuke first. Take, take your smoker, take your, take your gear and go out and take a look at it. Because I tell you what, what, one of the common things that you will see 
Well, I tell you what, look, look into a hive that was the result of a nuke produced maybe two or three years before. You open it up and those middle frames normally, unless there's been some jostling around, you can see those things should have been changed out a long time ago. In the commercial industry, a lot of the, a lot of the frames that are sold as nukes are in their third year. Those frames are, are combs, I should say. Those are third year combs. And so when you're getting, you know, a, a beginner doesn't understand to take a look at the quality of combs in a nuke. And so, you know, it, it, it saves some problems if you have a right of refusal whenever you talk to the, to the nuke producer. Now, the advantage of just going and having the ability to drive and pick them up is make sure you understand things whenever you talk to him on the phone. Um, make sure you understand that you do have the right of refusal, that he'll have the time to let you look in the nuke before you walk out. And of course, what you're looking for is all stages of brood and healthy, healthy and um, relatively good comb that you think is serviceable for a year or so. Um, but generally with nukes, I suggest people that we do this with, hey, consider checking out of the comb, the old comb, as soon as you can. Uh, work it out of, your, out of your hive and put in foundation and let the bees produce comb from your area and uh, there'll, be, there'll be a healthier colony like that. I think in, in, in my uh, estimation, they're gonna be healthy, healthier. Great recommendations, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and th the thing is, is that nukes, they can have disease, okay? They can have high mite loads, they can have disease. Um, always ask the producer of, of uh, absolutely nukes. Yeah, what is his management strategy whenever it comes to varroa? If you if you open up a nuke and it's got a you know an apistan strip in it, you know I would I would turn that away. Um, you know, I don't know if many of you can remember, but it used to be that we'd have little you know you order a queen in a queen cage and there'd be a little piece of apistan strip cut off and put in the screen where, she, where she's in contact with it. You know, th those days should be over, long, long over. There are other ways of taking care of, of uh, mite loads than some of these th synthetics. And as hobbyists, as sideliners that have relatively number, uh, limited number of bees, we have the time to be personally involved with each, with each hive. Commercial guys, they certainly don't have that time. That's why, and, and labor costs, that's why commercial guys, nuke producers, are often really focused in on uh, the simple ways of mite management, you know, synthetic chemicals. Uh, that's my view, for, I, and I'm sure that doesn't that doesn't uh, apply to all commercial producers. But uh, I'd say there's a tendency for them that have to deal with a large number of hives to use use synthetics. Um, nukes generally can't be shipped. That's why normally we, we uh, go to them. Here's an example, Judy, of, of some of the things that you'll see in a bad nuke. This wasn't a nuke approval when we went to the, uh, went to the producer. This was a situation where a person gave me a call and said, hey, I bought two nukes from this guy. One of them's doing great. And one of them's, I think it's dying. Help. And so I go out there and sure enough, um, what problems do people see with this? Uh, anybody, do you know? Diagnose this colony. What's wrong with it? All the bees are dead, by the way. Look at that brood pattern. Horrible anybody. comb. Drone What's that? comb. Horrible, horrible old cruddy comb. It, it is. This is all drone comb. Now, you, you know the magic, and I don't really understand all this. This is one of the mysteries that... Uh, I don't understand, but uh, you know, the, the other side of a frame is often a mirror image of the side you're looking at. And that's pretty much the case here. Everything circled in red is drone comb. Now, how beneficial and desirable is that for a beginning beekeeper? Um, this should have never have been sold as a nuke. But look down here at this scattered brood pattern. That's definitely European fowl brood. Uh, we, we diagnosed it. It uh, passed the test. Uh, the uh, field test, and it was definitely European fowl brood. So this came from a, from a nuke producer, and uh, that, that was a bad deal. 
The other hive, by the way, the other hive that was started just like this hive does well, but that's a, a European fowl brood problem. I've just in visiting with Sheldon, I understand that you just really don't have a whole lot of European fowl brood up there. It's intermittent down here. It's, it's an aggravation when it occurs, um, but there are certainly things I've dealt with it numerous times uh, through, through 50 years. Um, th there are certain ways that, that uh, beginners can protect against European fowl brood, recognize it, and uh, change things around so that they have a good chance of bringing that colony out of it. And one of the things I use a lot is a good strong nuke. And uh, we don't have time to get into that today. But anyway, that's probably what we've got there on. Okay. Do we have any questions about nukes? Time's up. Let's go to packages. All right. Hey, just a minute. I have a question. Okay. Just, I was just wondering what nukes sell for down there. Um, I'm up in Iowa, uh -huh. and they're going like 170 to 190. Yeah. What do nukes yeah. sell for down there? About the same. Okay. Yeah. And it, it could vary quite a bit, but yeah, basically that's the same. Now, the interesting thing, you know, like nukes, uh, those things are ready when they're ready, when they're ready on a local level. That's not necessarily true of packages. Now you think about this and packages can be shipped to you in Iowa. They're available to you in Iowa about the same time they're available to us. Okay, and I noticed, and I may have left this slide in here, a picture of Sheldon working, uh, installing packages. And it looks like there's not even a dandelion blooming. You know, you guys don't have any anything, any forage, so you're gonna be, uh, pumping the sugar syrup to them. Yeah. But down here, we, we would be in, you know, we'd probably be in dandelion territory and timing. Um, about the time that you're working with winters with a stocking cap on, that's what he's wearing. Um, and we, we would be farther ahead of you. So we would get, when we would get packages available for us at the same time you guys get packages available to you we already have some forage conditions going so i just looking at your situation and working with package bees when it's much colder you know three weeks to four weeks ahead i would consider ordering later for arrival later when you can you know just so that you've got a little bit of flush of uh, dandelions going. Uh, just, you know, try to package them when some of the fruit trees are blooming, um, that type of thing. So that they're leaving Georgia or they're leaving Florida and their, their system is, is gonna be a little stressed going into that. But anyway, I, I digress, I digress. Greg, I was gonna mention in our area, it's common for these nukes to coincide with kind of the wetter springs that we have. So chalk root is commonly an issue that we have. So if you have springs that tend to be wetter when we have more rains and the bees are more confined, that we right. see sometimes these nukes with a lot of chalk root. So that's something that you might not have to could be worried about too much, but with no. our finicky no. springs. I've seen it. Hard. I've seen it. I haven't seen it for five or six years and then only small amounts. And, you know, it's not a worry for us because uh, they seem to clean it up really good. Yeah. Um, for the, for those that uh, haven't had chalk brood before, know what it is. It's a fungal disease, and it affects it affects larvae, pupa, and you can actually take the frame and shake it because there's little mummies in there, chalky mummies, and you can shake it and they'll rattle rattle in the comb. Fortunately, the bees, you know, um, they snap out of it pretty quick. It down here, it has not been, it's not devastating at all. It's kind of a, I don't want to say a novelty, but it's an unwelcome novelty. Let me, let me put it that way. Okay, so packages are generally sold in uh, with pounds of bees and uh, there's about 3,500 bees to a pound roughly. So the most common is 
um, the most common size is three pounds, but you can get two pounds and anywhere from, I guess, two to five pounds. Uh, looking at that package that's pictured up there in the corner, to me, that is one full package. That would be a desirable package to have um, because there are a lot of healthy bees in there. So uh, anyway, packages, um, when they're put in that box, these bees are not necessarily related or grouped together genetically or very uh, closely genetically because in, in, the, in the package bee industry, what they do is they, they just go through shaking until they get the right poundage of bees into that, into that uh, box, which is gonna be three pounds. And they'll just go and they'll mix, mix them from different colonies. And all these ladies are sitting in there getting to know their, some of their sisters and then some that are not necessarily related closely to them. And then there'll be a queen introduced in a queen cage. There'll be a syrup bottle in there or a, a can and there will be a queen cage in there with an unrelated queen. And so these bees are, um, they're not the family unit that you would get in a, a nucleus. There are some pros to package bees. They're a little bit cheaper. They can be shipped even through the mail. Um, they come with a young queen and I thought this was interesting when I was reading this, uh, pulling this up today. At the last minute, uh, I noticed the word "hopefully" in there, so I put a question mark. It a question mark. Um, hopefully, it's laying for at least a week or two before they put it in the cage and put it into the into the uh, package. Um, it's probably I, I'm pretty sure it's probably the most common method for you to buy bees in Iowa, new bees. Um, down here, I don't know which would be, I'm, I'm guessing nukes would be more popular down here because it's easier for us to produce them. Uh, anyway, those are package bees. The cons, um, they're mostly unrelated. Uh, the method puts a little stress on the bees uh, due to the shipping and handling, and there's going to be losses if they're not taken care of in the shipping process. Um, and poor weather can, can delay shipping, can delay installation, and that can lead to um, some losses. And when we're thinking about that, here's, here's Sheldon, and I'm going to move right along with that because I, um, I think I've got another slide I want to show you. Yes, this one. Okay, it'll distress people whenever they take a look at uh, a package, and here are a whole bunch of bees on, on the bottom because they haven't made it. That's attrition through the shipping process. Maybe they got overheated, but just so you know, the industry standard, you can lose a lot of bees and still have a successful start from a, from a package if things work in your favor. Um, but the industry standard, if, if you've got a floor covered in bees, that's gonna concern you. If you've got an inch of bees on the, on the floor, that's gonna concern you. But basically, there's an industry standard that says if you've got about two inches of dead bees on the bottom, uh, perhaps you need to call your producer, you know, document things with a mail carrier, however it was shipped, and get on the phone to your producer and tell him, I've got this many bees in the bottom of that. And so they ought to, they ought to make it right if there's two inches or more um, bees there. Um, here are just some simple things about equipment prep. I want to let I want to leave some time for um, some questions. Apprentice beekeepers only order packages. You know these are recommendations that uh, come from UNL, I believe. Uh, I don't know if that's normally true down here. I wouldn't recommend packages for apprentices. I would recommend uh appropriately inspected nukes for somebody that's starting out with their first bee down here but that is for somebody that has some guidance that has some assistance from a more experienced beekeeper um anyway moving along but i'm i'm all for exploring other options you know when in beekeeping classes in so much literature you've got two options nukes and packages. Golly gee, there are other ways of getting it. And 
of getting getting your first start in bees. And the, the thing is, is that there appears to be a big rush always about this time of year. Get your order in early. And I've just that was true in colony collapse disorder days. You know, there weren't many out there. So they'd sell everything. And if you if you uh, tarried, you may not get your bees. You may not even get to order. So that's not necessarily the case now. Uh, nukes are much more readily available than what they were in years past. And um, so you can you can what, what I'm saying here is is don't hurry. If you're in your if you're in a bee journey and you haven't got your bees yet and you haven't a chance you haven't had a chance to go through bee school yet if you haven't had a chance to work with uh, an experienced beekeeper go to an open, open apiary or anything so you don't really understand much you just get pressure from other beekeepers that have had bees for 3 to 5 years who are saying oh you got to get them order early um, i know a lot of beekeepers that really use some sense um, heroes to hives is a good, good example study bees for a year, get that experience before you jump into obtaining your first bees. That's a recommendation that I would make for some people. Um, but, you know, we're all on different different journeys. Maybe you started last year and you've lost a hive and you don't have any other options, but you've got the equipment, um, you've cleaned out your, your comb from this dead out. You think a lot of this comb is reusable. You don't see any signs of disease. Maybe an experienced beekeeper's looked at it and you're thinking, hey, I met, maybe I can stick packages in here and, and they'll blossom. Well, may, maybe that's right. And maybe that's the right decision for you. Um, maybe you're a second year beekeeper and you've had hives survive and some not. OK, um, so you've got to be thinking, I need this spring. I need to fix a couple of dead outs I've got or a dead out. I lost a hive, I wanna make that hive back. Consider doing it without bees. Do it, I'm sorry, without packages or nukes. Do it through your own innovation and your study and your, your questioning with experienced beekeepers. Um, I don't know, beekeepers that have healthy colonies coming through the spring, they really ought to consider starting another hive from their healthy colonies. And you can do it in a way that doesn't uh, drastically reduce your honey production for that year. If you've got a, a good healthy hive coming out of winter, make a split on it, okay? And uh, whatever you do, set yourself a goal. If you're gonna make a split from your own hives this year, in my case, that's when I make the decision, okay, as soon as it's appropriate to feed sugar syrup, I'm going to start pumping it to this colony and this point colony because I'm going to I'm going to encourage them to really brood up, and then I'm going to make a split off of them, which will set them back and reduce that swarm instinct, and that will help them get to that ever important place where uh, the nectar flow starts. I don't know when yours is, but we can count on nectar flow our nectar flow down here in southern Missouri, anywhere from. Mother's Day to Fourth of July, probably, give or take, give or take something for weather and trends. But that's whenever you know if you've got a if you've got your hives in a box before nectar flow starts, um, they're going to have a lot of natural forage to go to brood up on to start building comb on. I'd recommend syrup in those cases when they don't have comb if you need to uh, build comb. But it's a great time of year for being a bee. It's a good time of year for being a beekeeper too. I enjoy spring very much. Uh, beekeepers that are starting out, you know, what's your goal? I'd highly recommend two and a half colonies. Um, that should be your goal to bring, take through the summer, develop it, and then go into the winter with healthy colonies in maybe a double deep or in a, a, a single deep in the, middle for that two for that half a colony. I love the two and a half colony system because this middle colony here, um, that is your resource hives that will produce brood for either one of these. If you keep this thin, you put you put um, you, and you keep everything. If you've got six hives, keep the two and a half together and then two and a half, maybe if it's only in your mind together, so that 
if you're swapping co uh, comb back and forth, and if there's a disease issue that you notice, you've only swapped comb back and forth between this one. And your chances of another two and a half colonies over on this stand over here uh, of, of still flourishing and this having a slight setback with some kind of disease, um, you, you keep that issue reduced of spreading a disease from one colony throughout the apiary. That's just a suggestion. But, but this is your spare queen. You know, if you've got an issue, uh, hey, we all kill queens. You know, I know it's accidental, but we have things happen. Uh, we, we drop a frame, we, oh man, one of the more expensive queens I ever bought. I watched that thing fall on, on the ground just as my foot covered it up and I smashed it. Um, things happen. And so if you keep a spare queen in here, pumping those uh, frames full of brood that you can change and put, you can swap uh, empty comb from here for the brooded up comb in here, the cap brood in here, just swap them back and forth or whichever needs, whichever needs a little assistance. It just builds them up strong. If you've got a young queen, then that added brood in there is great uh, for when the nectar flow comes. And so it's, it's just a, a good way of doing things. I've had a lot of, a lot of success with this. <clears throat> hey, but what if they, uh, but won't they fly back? Um, a, a split in the spring is very, very, very easy to do off, off a good brooded up colony, a colony that's just really, really uh, coming on strong. And it may be the best management decision you make to split a colony here because it will, will reduce some brood. It will open up the brood nest when you put more comb in there uh, or even foundation on the side so that the queen is, uh, the bees are productive and drawing more comb. The queen has a whole new environment. So uh, her, her tendency and the hive's tendency to think about swarming is reduced somewhat. But uh, I really like this. Uh, there was an article Bee culture or ABJ, I'm not sure, uh, Zach Lamas. And he describes a very simple, easily, to, easily done split. Um, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, this is the, I, I can't get it there. Let me back up here just real quick. See if I can copy off that. I can't, doggone it. Okay, let me back up. Um, how can I do this? I'd like to get you a link to this to this PDF. Um, and I'm not quite sure how I can do this, but whenever we start asking questions, maybe I'll be able to do this. We've only got about 10 minutes left. Um, but there's a very simple method that Zach Lamas has, it's, he's modified the Doolittle uh, split and it's easy for beginners. It's pretty hard to mess up. And you come out of it and you it's an easy way of making up for any lost colonies. And I'd encourage any new beekeeper that hasn't got their bees yet, be social, go to bee clubs, get to know some of your local beekeepers and get this PDF, which describes a very simple method and talk to an experienced beekeeper, hand him of that PDF and say, hey, could you help me out here? Um, I'd even buy, I'd even buy the, the split from you if you could help me out getting started with bees. And um, I think, I think some beekeepers would, uh, would do that if you want to compensate them. Um, a general guide is considering because you're buying brood, you're buying uh, frames of forage, you're going to buy about four or five frames, four frames at least, maybe $25 a frame, whether it's got brood or stores in it. And then create your own queen. Let your let your bees um, create their own queen. It could be done overnight, and you could have your nuke ready to take home the next day. Um, actually, this is a real good method because when you study the PDF, you'll realize it's only young bees you're enticing into this split that will be covering the brood that you've lured them in there with. Um, because they're only young bees, you can take this this split that's done in a nuke box and you can set it 20 feet away from the mother colony and your bees won't fly back because they're young bees and it's a it's an excellent system it works well and it would be it would be worth your while if you're thinking about how can I be a sustainable beekeeper 
which means you have the knowledge and, and skills necessary to bring colonies healthy through the winter to spring. And when you don't, and it happens to all of us, when you've got to make up for those bees that you have uh, lost, those hives you've lost, you have the tricks, the ability, the knowledge, and the resources in your surviving colony to not have to buy bees. You can start your own. And if you do it correctly, uh, or early as you possibly can, depending upon weather and the brooding, broodiness of the bees and, and those factors, um, you can do that and reduce the swarm tendency in the hive you take those, those bees from. So it's a it's a win-win. So that being said, seriously, I talk bees all the time on the phone. If anybody's got any questions, if they want some uh, telephone advice. And again, you gotta, gotta remember, I don't know your local conditions um, at all, but I can tell you what would work probably in, in my situation. And my phone number is down there, my email address is on there. And if I can help you, uh, that's what I'm here for. Great, so. that was great. I, I think um, the, the picture of the two and a half colonies, we do a similar thing, but instead of having the small colony, we do a queen bank for the apiary. Oh, sure. We manage yeah. a lot more bees, you know, for research and teaching. But it's the same concept. We keep a small hive for resource resources and then extra queens, and so we can pull them out if we need it. But they're oh, caged in there. Are these three frames? Is this is this a ten frame box that you've divided into thirds and have three frames in each section? No, it's oh. it's a it's a one deep colony, but one, one frame. Okay has uh, just yeah. a frame modified to carry the queen caged queens. And then gotcha. we have to supply it with old brood. So we'll, we'll put sealed gotcha. brood in there once a week, but it, it helps us pull, we pull out resources because that colony mm -hmm. has nothing to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, we pull out honey and pollen out of there to fill other, you know, colonies as needed. And then huh. we occasionally put brood in there, but we maintain it for a couple of months until everything equalizes in our yards. Sure. It's a nice way to keep some extra, you know, handy queens, especially if you find extras. You don't want right. to, you know, pinch them right away. So it's right. a nice, you know, temporary spot. Sure. Yeah, in this resource colony where I've, where I've got queens walking around the comb laying eggs, and I need that queen to bolster another colony, you know, for whatever reason, uh, just do an OTS. We move that queen, do an OTS on some of her um, eggs, actually extremely young larva, mm -hmm. as small as can be. And then I like to return four days later and see where I did the OTS and um, cut out and eliminate any cap cells that the bees have started in another area of the hive mm -hmm. because those cells that you cut out are not going to produce potentially as nice a queen as you have selected where you want them to, to raise a queen. So yeah, that's one of the tricks with OTS. People often say that um, an emergency raised queen is lower quality than a supersedure queen, which is lower quality than a, you know, a swarm queen. Well, there are tricks around that. And, and so anyway, that's what I do when making an OTS. And people have to kind of be careful about where they are in terms of splits, because it's, it's, it's funny, you know, in Nebraska, I didn't, I didn't expect this, but in eastern Nebraska, in more of these urban areas, in spring, there's not enough drones to do walkaway splits. There's not enough drones in order for the queens to have well-mated queens if we do early splits in the spring. But on the western side in Nebraska, there's enough commercial beekeepers coming back from almond pollination that those colonies are packed full of drones. So they can split, they can, you know, do multiple triple splits and not worry about queen um, mating issues at all. So, and it, it's very strange because their climate's colder than ours, but our, our, you know, the way that beekeeping is structured in our state is different. Well, it's, it wasn't cold where they came from in, in the almond fields. And so, you know, that may be a factor. And I guess 
those bees are going to be in transit here probably next week. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know, Randall, do you have these issues in Iowa where you have concentrated, you know, almond bee cup bee keepers coming in where you don't have any mating issues? Um, I haven't noticed any mating, but I've, I have not done an early spring split here yet. Um, since a lot of our, we, a little, we, we shook packages. Yeah. So it wasn't the same thing. Yeah. Um, so, so no, that's not something I've noticed. I, and I was thinking, you know, you kind of were inspiring me, Greg. I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to split a bunch of packages this spring, but Judy, you're kind of the first one to say, well, <laughs> there might not be very many drones to actually mate a new queen yet. So that's I'm why we keep, keep the queen mind. bank because we order mated queens on hand and then we bank them just for that. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, so I'm learning something. <laughs> So Greg, take, take him down to Perry around Bromberg's yards. Yeah, that's all I'll do. Yeah, that's one of our, the Bromberg's are one of the, our big commercial beekeepers here. We'll just be getting back uh, with all their bees here pretty soon from almonds. So Greg, I have a, I have a question, a sort of question, kind of comment question. We are people who seem to lean more towards packages for the exact same reason that Judy mentioned for people that are starting new, uh, new in beekeeping because we feel like it grows with them. As far as getting packages, you mentioned that they will ship them. And for the people that I've dealt with that have had them shipped in, that has not been a good experience. I uh, UPS and USPS or whoever is shipping them, they, they apparently don't love bees like we love bees and they don't take care of them the way that we would. So I, I, we have several bee suppliers in our area, not, I mean, we could have more, but they will bring in several hundred packages of bees and then they have the bee day that's kind of like the chick day and people go there. I would admonish people not to fall for the have it shipped to your house message and go drive a couple hours and pick up your package of bees from somebody. Now that's my experience. If you've got another one, I would love to hear it, but, but that's, yeah. That sounds like good advice. I, you know, the interesting thing about packages, you can also, you can sugar dust them. We shook, uh, we shook 77 varroa mites out of a package. And awesome. we were yeah, we were looking at this and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, we were astounded, astounded at the mite load mm -hmm. until you do the math and it was less than 1%. Well, yeah, it's out of the whole package. That's probably true, but still, oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's my Jesus. So it, I don't know whether you guys have that, but we have several people that will bring them in. It's it's a big deal, but the packages always arrive in better shape than if UPS handles them. Something I didn't mention was that packages give you an advantage over nukes, or at least one advantage, is that when you install your packages, they're building combs for the next several days and whatnot, and you've got six or seven days to do a, a oxalic acid dribble on them mm -hmm. uh, because you won't have any capped through yet. Yep. Uh, so that's that's one of the advantages if you do need to knock back loads. Very, very effective. Very effective. Good job. Thanks for sharing tonight. You're welcome. Well, in the chat, I have uh, put that Zach Lamas um, split article in my Dropbox, and the link is there to it. And I would encourage you. It's interesting biology. If you study that, it's it's a lesson in biology, and I would encourage uh, new beekeepers who haven't reached that sustainable pay, uh, mark yet um, to read that and and think about the biology that allows that to happen. That's all I've got. Thank you, Greg. That was a really great presentation. Uh, do we have any questions, comments? There's been a lot of really great feedback on the chat box saying thank you. It's been really great. Um, Greg, when you do your splits, do you split into nukes? Yes. Nuke boxes? Yes, but you don't have to. Um, I like it if earlier, you know, if temperatures aren't really cooperative, 
and I feel like the need to split, but I like to wait till it's a little bit warmer. But see, we could we could split if we're interested in you know more bees. We could split up until May fifteenth easily, and those bees would be able to uh, fill it double deep and to go into the winter healthy um, with forage if they've got it. So uh, there's nothing wrong down here. We have no problem in waiting a little bit longer so that a cold snap isn't gonna be a major concern um, with the split. Greg, we had a question earlier that um, Kim mentioned she had EFB on uh, the, their first hive and lost it, started the treatment too late in the season to save them. Can I reuse these combs? I have froze them. I didn't hear that last sentence, Judy. She wants to know if she can reuse those combs. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would not um, use any combs that had brood raised in them. Um, peripheral, peripheral frames, you bet. Um, and then start with a good strong nuke again and your bees ought to, ought to just flourish. We find it intermittent, EFB down here intermittent. And I'm convinced that there's EFB bacteria in about everywhere. Um, and it's a stress disease. And whenever it's, it triggers, it's bad. Um, unfortunately, to the untrained eye, it's really, really, really hard to diagnose until dead larvae start appearing mm -hmm. and they're visible to you because the nurse bees are so effective when you've got a large number of nurses, they're so effective at removing the small dead larva. Um, and then when the population of the hive declines because of the disease, then um, your larva then starts melting and those are relatively easy to see, but then your population of bees is in trouble. So you really try to try to latch onto EFB as early as possible. And then Jay Cooper wanted to know if OTS stands for on the spot. Yes. Okay. And then we had another question regarding. Oh, what was it? Uh, oh, are you planning on discussing or catching swarms? Do I catch swarms? Mm -hmm. I don't. It is so much easier to make a split. And, you know, but I highly encourage new beekeepers to do it because it's such a fun deal to do. I, you know, it, it really is enjoyable. And I can't begin to tell you the number of swarms I've hived in the past. But when you're busy, when you got to get things done, it's, you can do it easier by making splits when you've got the bees to work with. Um, Mike K asks any work on UNL classes this year? I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that question refers to. Maybe you can rephrase that for us, Mike. Greg, Greg is um, um, a part of GPMB and so he's, he's gonna be doing some open apiary work, I think, and potentially, um, hopefully we can get him to be uh, some guest seminar speakers for some of our programming over the summer as well. Um, Kim wanted to clarify so she can use the honey frames. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that question. Oh, uh, Kim wanted to clarify that for the, the EFB example that she gave, she wanted to see, um, she, uh, so the honey frames would be okay to use. And there was a mm -hmm. comment in there that suggested that the combs be cleaned with um, bleach and water solution. The woodenware probably should. Um, wh whenever I'm talking about reusing, I would I would set any comb aside. Um, you know, if you if you can if you can save the honey, if you want to use it and save it, EFB is not an issue for people's health. Okay, there's no diseases that that are readily transmitted that bees get that we get. A person could utilize the honey that's there 
Normally though, there's not going to be much because EFB is a stress disease in the early spring, normally. Um, but I'd be reluctant to use, reuse any honey. Um, I'd use, I'd use blank comb. And if I've got it, if I don't really need to put that comb in service, I'd store it for a year. I'd, I'd store it till the following year. And there was a note saying that honey frames can have viruses. I think, you know, that it's really hard to tell whether or not a frame is good or not, because you, there's, you know, a, a healthy colony with lots of strong, nutritious food can kind of ward off a lot of these things. So that, it's true, it could be in the comb, but it might not be affecting them. True. So true. It, it, it's, it's, it is true that there could be some of these pathogens. I would say that if there's minor evidence of some of these brood diseases, and you're not sure whether or not you should throw these things away or clean them or do what or not. Like Greg said, maybe take them out of rotation for a season or what I would do is mark the top of those frames, put them into the colony and see if you can continually get poor performing brood patterns or issues with these frames. Cause you could yeah. put healthy hives back in those and if the equipment is tainted, those bees are not going to perform well. That's true. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can clean or treat or take them out of rotation. Maybe just think about how you uh, call frames in your own operation or make note of these problem frames. You know, also for peace of mind, sometimes it's better just for your own peace of mind, get rid of all the frames and, um, yeah, you know, I'm a big I'm a big believer in reduce, recycle, reuse, but and and it's the it's the uh, plastic that uh, plastic frames that I have a hard time throwing away, and I seldom do. I soak them in in uh, wash powder and solution for a week, and then power spray them to reuse them again. It's a lot of work, and I think I'm through doing that probably pretty much because I I just soon spend my time doing something that's fun instead of power washing frames and getting wet <laughs> so, so sometimes it's good to start over and Zed, is, Zed wanted to know if uh or when when do you split and uh what distance do you recommend um pulling that split away from the mother colony sure if you use the uh Modified Doolittle split that Zach promotes, um, you could you could move them five or six feet away, and reduce the entrance. The entrance needs to be reduced on any split, and it'll be good to go. Now, if you do a walkaway split, it's probably more beneficial to do it by taking uh, one of the colonies a couple of miles away, um, because if you do a walkaway split and try to put it in the same apiary, you have a pretty soon, within a day or two, you've got all the old bees in their split that you have back in, the, in their old home. And so you've got out of balance colonies. Um, so moving them two miles is pretty good, pretty good idea when you don't do the modified Doolittle split. Uh, we have a comment from Galaxy Note saying that the pilot, there was a pilot study done by Cornell folks um, that said that overwintered honey from dead outs all had bee viruses. They just finished, he, uh, they just finished a Zoom before this talk or joined and it was a great talk. So looking forward to hearing more about it. I'm not surprised. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of um, things that comb can sequester, including chemical residues as well as, you know, bacteria, viruses, and, um, you know, mites and more. Uh, yeah, I so, remember. Go ahead, Greg. I just want to point out a recent study that we looked at last fall, I think, said that um, dead outs, whenever you put them back on the same combs, the older combs, they don't do as well the following year, you know. Not doing as well doesn't mean they do bad, but it's it's a personal decision. Um, I've had quite a bit of luck, you know, uh, just 
putting them, putting them and letting them go. Yeah, I think it's a fine balance in making them build comb and um, uh, reducing, you know, that that extra burden of all the residues and all the diseases that start to accumulate and build up. Um, now, Zed was wondering, it sounds like I'm just curious because you have four seasons here in the Philippines. It's just rainy and dry season in bee feeding. How do you feed in the winter process of once a week? Or how, how do you feed in the winter? Or how do you prepare for winter? I think I think we have a someone who's who maybe does not have the four seasons that we do. A lot of the overwintering preparation happens in the fall. So we're feeding in preparation for winter. There might be some winter feed to boost like this time of the season. Greg in Missouri, do you use supplemental feed? Do you add any candy boards now? I don't. I in the, in the spring, basically I try to get as much uh, natural honey in there as possible. I want them to harvest it. I don't take, I've never taken any fall honey. That's for the bees. And so um, I have to feed to get them through the winter. I want them to have 50 pounds, 40, 50 pounds. I'm, I'm guessing by weight. And how I guess by weight is I'll have two cinder blocks out there on a stand in my apiary. and I will have them on a board and I will put my fingers under the lip of the bottom cinder block and I'll pick it up with the other cinder block on top of it. And the weight that I'm feeling, I don't know exactly what that weighs, but I do know through experience that if I've got a colony that weighs that amount, it's got a good chance of getting through the winter easily on the stores it's got. Doesn't save us with queen problems or something like that. But from the standpoint of weight, that's what I use in my apiary is just that little cheating method. Yep, and we try to um, leave hives with at least a hundred pounds of, of weight. Um, and I, I also use a tipping method, <laughs> but um, a lot of times we will have to supplement a little bit of sugar feed in the fall. Um, yeah. This time of the season, uh, Luke will go out and check on weight to see how many hives need to be reversed or how many of these colonies that are light need to be supplemented with a candy board or some sort of supplemental feed. Yeah, yeah. Um, I use yeah we also will try to supplemental sugar feed in the spring to build up, but trying to use as much natural nectar as possible. We don't use any pollen supplements though. Yeah. We, we don't either. We, I think that we have enough pollen from our tree species that, that we don't have an issue with that. But, but I do, when my colonies are light in January, early February, I'll put a sugar cake with a sugar cake with a rim. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> that an old... That's my wife. <laughs> it sounds like an old uh, horn. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been fun. Thank you so much.